The people of Israel have started on a journey. And we've been looking at that the last few weeks in church as we looked at the book of Exodus. Last week we saw the plagues and that they raised a question for the Egyptians. Who is this God? For the Israelites it was the same question, who is this God? And added to that is, what is he like? We come to the story of the Passover, which asks the people if they are ready to follow God, the God that they have been learning about through Moses. They have to accept God, what God is saying, and decide for themselves to follow. If you want to read the story, you notice that it stretches for 77 verses. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach on every verse. Though I normally do it verse by verse. I've chosen to read a small bit and we will read that in a minute. But if you want to get the full picture of the story, I encourage you to read the passage later. Exodus 11, 1 to 13, 16. Around 50 of those 77 verses focus on the different rules and regulations relating to the Passover feast. Why does God spend so much time instructing the people how to celebrate this event? Moses even says to tell the story to everyone and to anybody who asks. In 12.2 it says, speak to the whole community. Tell your children the story. But why? Part of the reason Moses wants the story to be told is it is the story of God working. It's the story of how God saved the nation many years ago. But I want to focus on this question, why? The why question is a very difficult question to answer. At any time, it's very hard. I'm sure there's not a child anywhere who has not asked why to everything. Children are naturally curious. They want to know what's happening. They see something, they are asked to do something, and they ask why. They want to understand. It's time to brush your teeth. Why? Because we brush our teeth at bedtime. Why? Because we want to have healthy teeth. Why? So you can chew. Why? And before your preschooler can ask another why, the parent shuts it down and says, it's bedtime, go to bed. <laughs> Sometimes cleaning their teeth first. And you're tired and you don't want to answer those sort of questions. Yet I find it so interesting that it's not only children that ask the why question. One day a man asked his wife why she always cuts the end off the roast when she puts it into the oven. Her response was, well, my mum did it, so I do it. She went to ask her mum. Mum said, grandma did it, so I do it. So she went to ask her grandmother. Grandmother said, your great-grandmother did it, so I did. Fortunately, the great-grandmother was still alive. And though she was quite old, the, re the lady really wanted to know why she cut the ends off her roast. Why do you always cut them off? Her grandmother's response is, I have no idea why your mum does it or why your grandmother does it, but I do it because my pan was too small for the roast. <laughs> the story is so true of many things in our life. We continue to do things in the same way and we don't often stop and ask why. Often the only reason why is because we're taught to do it that way. How do you do up your shoelaces? Because you're taught to do it that way. Maybe it's a tradition that you follow. Maybe you're doing what others do. Much of what we do here in church makes many people ask the why question. And I'm afraid too often in life, and certainly in church, 
We don't think things over. And we don't know the answer. We keep on doing things over and over and over and over, following the tradition, following what others do. But we don't know the answer and we haven't thought about it. Why do we have readings from the Bible in church? Why do we have a sermon? Why do we meet on Sunday? Why do we eat a meal each month comprising of a small amount of bread and wine? Why do Baptists use grape juice and not wine? And you can go on with all sorts of questions like that. Have you noticed that we're taking communion today? Thank you, Kath and Pay, for the beautiful table. You'll have to come and have a look and see what a Passover feast table is like and what a communion table is like and I'm sorry because of COVID we have to use those separate elements but at least you can get a good look at what's been set up here before but it's not the first Sunday of the month so did you ask when you came in why is the steward giving me this communion I know one person done did and the answer was because I said so. <laughs> That's the wrong answer. <laughs> Why are we having communion today? I hope that after today you will have a good answer. The first step in answering the why question is to gain an understanding and awareness of what we are doing and or what we have seen. The Bible reading today shows us that the people of Israel ask the why question at the beginning of every year. Why do we celebrate Passover? Why do we eat roast meat and flat bread? And Moses answered, tell them a story. Have you noticed that the Bible often answers the why question with a story? So today, today we're going to have a look at the Passover story and see if it can help us the question of why are we doing communion today? Thank you, Karen, for reading the Bible for us. Good morning. Start again. So today we'll be reading a Bible passage from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. The first Passover sacrifice, and I'll be reading from the NIRV our version. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Egypt. He said, from now on, this month will be your first month. Each of your years will begin with it. Speak to the whole community of Israel and tell them that on the 10th day of this month, each man must get a lamb from his flock. A lamb should be chosen for each family and home. Suppose there are not enough people in your family to eat a whole lamb. Then you must share some of it with your nearest neighbor. You must add up the total number of people there are. You must decide how much lamb is needed for each person. The animals you choose must be males that are a year old. They must not have any flaws. You may choose either sheep or goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole community of Israel must kill them when the sun goes down. Take some of the blood, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where you eat the lambs. That same night, eat the meat cooked over a fire. Also eat bitter plants and eat bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat when it is raw. Don't boil it in water, instead, Cook it over a fire. Cook the head, the legs, and inside parts. 
Do not leave any of it until the morning. If some is left over until the morning, burn it up. Eat the meat while your coat is tucked into your belt. Put your sandals on your feet. Take your walking stick in your hand. Eat the food quickly. It is the Lord's Passover. That same night, I will pass through Egypt. I will strike down all those born first among the people and the animals. And I will judge all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Carl. Let me quickly recap the story of Exodus so far. The story that we've been looking at. The people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. God heard their cries for help and sent Moses to take them to a new land, to save them from that slavery. The Passover was instituted at the end of the plagues that God had sent upon Egypt. God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. To make a long story short, Pharaoh's heart was hardened against God and he refused to let the people go. As one writer said, Light is consumed by darkness, frogs everywhere, the water becomes a source of death rather than life. Locusts ate the crops, hail, little chlorine insects, lice, flies, disease. Pharaoh still refused to let the people go. God then planned to send the last and final plague. This time all the first pearl children and animals would perish in one night, would die in one night. That's a very bad plague. But God provided a way out of losing their firstborn. God instructed every household of Israel to select a year old lamb without defect. Take it from the sheep or the goats. The head of the household was to kill the lamb at twilight, taking care that none of the bones were broken. Apply some of the blood on the sides of the doorpost of the house. The lamb was to be roasted and eaten as roast meat by the family in that house. God said when he saw the blood on the doorsteps, he would pass over that house and not permit the destroyer to come in. Any home without the blood would have their firstborn struck down and the animals that were there that night as well. This moment was a defining point for the people of Israel. It was so important that God says that it's going to reset your calendar. It's going to become your new year celebration. It's going to, you, your year is going to start with it. From now on, this month will be your first month. Each of your years will begin with it. The whole community was to remember this day forever. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which comes at this time as well, was part of the New Year celebration. Why? Because this event defined who God was for the Israelites. It was defining the people's relationship to God. Whenever the people of Israel wanted to remember God, they were taken back to this story of how God relates to them. For the people of Israel, the Passover must never be forgotten because to forget this was to forget God. You should be able to see where I'm going when I look at the communion service and answering the question, why communion? I hope it's the answer that you got. But to help us here, let us, I, I want to take two defining ideas that define the ways the people relate to God and understand God. The first and most important lesson is that the people belong to God. They belong to God. The first aspect of the Passover and the communion meal made real for the people of Israel that they belong to God. God owns them. God 
is their protector, is there for them. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate for me every firstborn male, a firstborn offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animals. On the surface, this is talking about the firstborn animals and people belonging to God. And you must remember that in Jewish culture, as with many other cultures, the firstborn represents the whole family. So it is the whole people of God. So how did this work out for the people of Israel? Whenever an animal had its first offspring, the animal belongs to God. The way to give it to God is to kill it, to burn it as a sacrifice. The smoke goes up to God as his part. And in this case, the people eat the meat. But what about newborn humans? Human babies, should we kill them too? No, again, no, 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 no. God, our God is not like that. Moloch, the god of the Moabites, used to say, you need to sacrifice your children. But the God of Israel, the one true God, repeatedly said, that's not going to happen. That's not what I want. That, he detests that sacrifice. There's never... Ask his people to do such thing so they don't kill the newborn babies. Instead, God provided a way. The people were to redeem their first child. That's, that is, they were to buy it back with a lamb. They killed the lamb, or for poor people, it was a turtle dove later on, in the place of a boy and a girl or a girl. God planned to send this last plague to Egypt. This time all the firstborn animals and children were to die in one night. Only those who observed the command of God, as set out in this chapter, would survive. Well, why do they have to sacrifice their firstborn child or animal? Exodus 13 says, When the time to come, your son asks, What does this Passover meal mean? You shall say to him, by the strong hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It is because God brought you out of slavery into freedom. It's so important to understand that the firstborn represents the whole family too. What the dedication of or consecration of the firstborn done is quite radically set up a, re a relationship where the people belong to God. The firstborn are now his. They represent the whole people. The people are now his. The people belong to God. They belong to God. The people of Israel belong to God. So that's the first part of their relationship with God that the Passover established. The second part is that they were rescued by God. It's interesting that all the other plagues didn't touch Israel. The Israelites lived in a separate part of Egypt, in Goshen, and when the plagues came, they didn't go into that land. The, the flies didn't go to Goshen. The, the frogs didn't go in there. Maybe it was bad land, I don't know, but God was able to keep the other plagues away. But now, the Israelites and the Egyptians are drawn into God's final plague. Israel's involvement in the last plague is very significant. If the Israelites did not trust God and follow God's way, his instructions for that night, their firstborn would die too. The need for salvation is made clean, clear and the atoning sacrifice is provided for anyone who would paint the doorsteps with the blood. And stay indoors and feed and eat the lamb. The conditions of the redemption are laid out and Israel must follow it, must show faith to be saved. Another moment that the why question comes might be in the, in the week around New Year, which is the festival of un unleavened bread. For the week following the Passover, 
New Year's celebration, they had to eat nothing with yeast in it. They had to eat flat bread. Bread that could be cooked quickly, just flour and water put together and cooked. You didn't have to wait for it to rise. Why did Moses say that? And he answers the question, it is because the, what the Lord did for you when you came out of Egypt. In Exodus 12, 8. The unleavened bread reminds them that God had brought them out in a hurry. Unleavened bread is, traveler, is traveler's food. If you're traveling, you haven't got somewhere to put bread to rise. You have to just take it as it is, with no yeast. The, the Passover reminded them that God got them out of Egypt. He, they belonged to God and he rescued them. And the people remembered it by reacting it, reenacting it. They would eat the same food and that they ate on the night that they came out of Egypt. The unleavened bread for a week afterwards would remember the fact that God brought them out and the Passover invites them to remember that they belong to God. And day, year after year, the people of Israel had to take a lamb, kill it, and do two things with it. They had to put the blood on the doorstep and they had to eat the roast meat. Um, this was a substitute for the firstborn. But the need for obedience and faith makes the plague, this last plague, very different from all the others. With the others, God knew where Goshen was and was able to pass by. With this one, though, they had to be obedient. They had to kill the lamb the way God had said. They had to stay indoors protected by the lamb's blood on the doorstep. They had to eat, eat the meal, identifying themselves with the lamb. Here's where we see that this firstborn is a representative of the whole family. The whole family had to eat the meat, and they had to eat all of it and not leave any behind or burn up what was left behind. They also had to stay indoors. Can you imagine when your neighbor cries out because his firstborn has died? Would you stay indoors? But that's what the Israelites had to do. That's how God got them out of Egypt. God came to Egypt. He's the rightful owner for Egypt. And God's presence is terrifying. And God told the Israelites that they could be safe by killing the lamb and by staying indoors and by doing what they were told, being protected by the blood of the lamb. That event shaped the whole nation. The whole nation even today are very strong in that they belong. They are God's people because they celebrate this thing every year. They remember it. They, they believe they will be rescued by God. The Jews today still believe that. Now we have a better understanding of the Passover and what it did for the Jewish people. We can better understand what Jesus and his disciples were getting ready to do on that last night before he died. The night that God's firstborn would be sacrificed for everyone. The meal in the upper room became our communion meal each month. And their story is our story. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross changed everything for us. And though we've moved a bit ahead from killing lambs each year, we notice that it still is so important to us. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Apostle Paul said, Get rid of the old yeast when you can. It's like a new batch of dough without yeast. That is where you really are. You became Christ. Our Passover lamb has been offered up for you. For the Jews, the death of the lamb on the first Passover was the event that made them who they are. Since then, we've discovered that Passover lambs don't last for long. Because every year you have to sacrifice the lamb. Every year you have to 
recover over your sins. Over and over and over again, the lambs are slain. Year after year, on the Day of Atonement, lambs died to cover the sins of the people. To buy back their children's lives, their lives. But that sacrifice was not enough for everybody. The blood of sheep and goats could never take away the sin of earth. Could only cover it over. When Jesus arrived, everything changed. John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So for us, the death of Christ, Christ our Passover Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, makes us who we are. The difference is that lambs could only cover the sin. Jesus, the sinless one, got rid of our sin because he was willing to choose to die for us. The blood still plays an important role. And you can say, well, communion, we don't have much blood, do we? The first Passover night, the Israelites had to take the blood and put it on the doorpost. And, the, and that night, the death angel came across. He was not looking for the Jewish religious symbol. He was not looking for good people. He was not looking for beautiful dwellings. He was not looking for a sinless. He was looking for the blood on the doorstep on the doorpost and the people inside that doorpost or behind that doorpost were safe it was only the blood that was able to save them I hope you understand that that's true today too it's only the blood of Jesus that was shed in his death that can take away your sin now we are those who belong to God we are those who are rescued by God and like the Jews we must never forget that first Passover when Jesus died on the cross for us. Since then, his salvation is for all. That's why we eat this bread. That's why we have communion together. We remember who God is for us. So Jesus passed around the bread and the wine saying that we should do this in remembrance of him and we should never forget it. And that's why we eat together as a family of God because we belong to God. So we recognize that when we come to God, he is in charge. That's why we we hear the Bible reading in our service each Sunday. We want to hear what God is saying. That's why we have a sermon telling the story of who God is for us. That's why we end with the words, go in peace and love and serve the Lord. For those who have been rescued by God can go from here in peace. For those who belong to him, so we go from here to serve. So the next time you're tempted to wonder why we do certain things in church, the next time you're asked by a curious child or by your neighbor, Why do you go to church? What do you do? Why do you do these things? The answer is, let me tell you a story. It's the story of Jesus. It's the story of Jesus in my life. It's the story of the saints in glory. It's the story of Christ, our Passover lamb, who died so that God can come and deliver his people. It's a story that changed everything. Now, I belong to God. Now, I have been rescued by God. So you belong to God, you're rescued to God. One day, the death angel is going to come to your household too. He will not be looking to whether you were christened as a baby or baptized as an adult. He will not be looking whether you're Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or something else. You will not be looking for whether you did good work so that you will be, you were a good person. The only thing he's going to be looking for is whether the blood has been applied to the doorposts of your life because of your faith in Jesus Christ. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's why we have communion. Not tradition, not because we must, not because communion makes us better or more holy, 
but rather to answer the question why. We have communion because we tell the story of Jesus who died for us. Because we belong to him. Because we have been rescued for him. So we're going to have communion today. That's why I thought it would be good to celebrate this today. It's not the first of the month. But that doesn't matter. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I passed on to you what I received from the Lord on the night that the Lord Jesus was handed over to his enemies. He took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It is given for you. Every time you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do it in memory of me. You eat the bread and drink the cup, and when this do, you do this, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. To tell the story of how we belong to Jesus and have been rescued by Jesus, we celebrate communion. So as we ate, eat and drink, I want you to think about who you're going to tell the story, what story you're going to tell in answer to the question of why we do communion. So we're going to have communion together and you, if you don't have it, put your hand up and someone will bring it to you. To say we belong to God and that we have been saved by God. Let me pray together. Thank you, dear Lord, that you did go and die on the cross for us. Even though it was painful for you, and even though you were sinless, you died for me, for each one of us, for each one who would put their faith in you. Lord God, in this communion service, we come before you. We remember that you gave us your body, we remember that you spilt your blood for us. As we eat and drink together, we want to show that we are one, that we are your family, that we belong to you, that we have been rescued by you. So by faith, we eat and drink together to proclaim that you are our God. So let us eat together and drink together. Thank you, Lord, that you are our story. That we can answer the question of why we do this because of what you have done for us. Give us the words, the opportunity, the chance to share what we know about you with others. And may we together worship you as we celebrate today. Amen. Thank you, worship team.